you've reached the Signal Watch. Movies, television, comics, and more. I'm your host, Ryan Steens. Join me and our cadre of co-contributors as we examine cultural artifacts of the 20th century, boldly explore the 21st, and try to put it all in perspective. Stay tuned. We're going to try to make this work. Hey everybody, and welcome to a very special edition of the Signal Watch. As always, I'm your host Ryan Steens, and with me today is uh, Stuart. Hello. Hey Stuart, welcome back, man. Thank you. So we started talking about this, and this may be a harebrained scheme, but we decided we we're going to watch a whole bunch of King Kong movies and then talk about them. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure why that seemed like a great idea, but it did. <laughs> so you guys get to listen to us do this. <laughs> I think the thing was at the time as we were talking about doing a, a King Kong podcast and and then, you know, should we should we do it on like one episode per movie? And I basically said, well, every every King Kong movie is an adaptation of the same story. So we should just compare all of them together. Yeah. And I expected you to, to push back on that and you did not. You did not. <laughs> It seemed like a great idea till I watched like six King Kong movies in a row. <laughs> um, but no, I, so I'm going to, I'm going to also say like up front, um, we had a conversation kind of pre conversation on over like direct message today over like, this is going to end up bleeding into us because we're going to be comparing contrasting movies. And I, you know, we're going to try not to get too high fluting. But we were kind of like, this is this feels a little like some scholarly work, man. This <laughs> we're, we're bleeding into unknown territory here. Um, I can't remember exactly how you well, phrased Kong, it. I mean, Kong is so kind of synonymous and wrapped up with Americana, you know, and and film history, and uh, you know, cultural depictions of various um, uh, groups and such. And so it's hard to, it, I mean, it's hard to even discuss without getting a little scholarly about it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where it's interesting kind of seeing these movies kind of rub up against each other as reflections of their time. Um, and, you know, talk about it being kind of this Americana to me, Kong almost has, I don't know how to put this, but so one of the earliest stories I ever remember being fascinated by was the story of King Kong. My dad had some book around the house and I actually, I was hoping it would show up in the mail. I bought it on eBay, but it still hasn't shown up yet. Uh, it was a 76 hardcover book with like this red cover. And it was like an adaptation of King Kong, like an illustrated storybook sort of thing, but like written up, not necessarily like a novel level, but like a picture book for kids or for like a, like a it, coffee table book. I'd say almost like for like middle school kids. Cool. But, but my, yeah, I remember, I remember like it was kind of, you know, they kept all the same scares from the original movie in it and were like had illustrations of like, I think the guys on the log and all of that. Um, but to so to me, this almost has this like Ur legend, aspect to it because it's one of the earliest narratives I remember is girl is stealing an apple gets grabbed by this director. She gets put on a boat and next thing you know, she, there's this, you know, mysterious Island and she's kind of finding love along the way. And uh Oh, 35 foot eight, you know, <laughs> 
and you know then the whole thing of you know him ending up in new york and this whole like this the the journey of what is essentially like the 80 odd minutes of the king kong movie is just like burned in there i hadn't seen the movie i don't think i actually saw the movie until high school so like, your first your first experience with Kong was this book. It was the book. And then when I was about five, watching the 1970s version all, on TV all the way up till when somebody gets stepped on. No. <laughs> then somebody turned off the TV. Then my mom saw yeah. the me just go white <laughs> and was like, you're out of here. So I watched right? it all the way to the part where he's in New York and I just yeah. I never saw oh. the ending. So yeah. you didn't know how it turned out. I, well, you from well, the book, I did because right? I'd read the book. Yeah. yeah. But it was like, it was just too much to see someone get stepped on by Kong. <laughs> uh, apparently all people getting murdered, getting thrown off the log was nothing. Didn't care about those guys. Um, but the stranger and the, you know, movie. wasn't there somebody, didn't it? There, there's somebody that he bites their head off or bites. That may have been cut out for the TV. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Watching. Okay. So, um, and then I saw, King Kong lives in the theater when I'm it sorry. opened. It was, it was, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was a thing that happened to me and we watched it and we'll talk about it. You watched it too, right? You watched King I Kong. I did. Lives? Yeah. Okay. That was actually the first Kong movie that I saw was King Kong lives before I saw the original, before I saw the seventies Kong, I saw King Kong lives first. It's a hell of an entrance to King Kong. <laughs> Sure is. Well, that's not how I was introduced to the because, like, like you, I was aware of the story before I saw the movies. For me, I mean, because it, it's just one of those things. It's like, it's like Dracula, right, or Frankenstein, or one of these these iconic monsters that are just endlessly parodied and referenced. So you just, even if you've never seen, you know, Bela Lugosi's Dracula or read the novel, you still know sort of an outline of what the story is. And it's the same way I think with Kong. You still know. You know, it's a giant gorilla. He steals, steals the girl. He gets brought to the to New York. He climbs the building and he gets shot down. You know that that sort of outline of it, and that's what I knew about it. And I thought, you know, because I like giant monsters, that sounded cool. And but to me, the first the first big um, experience I had with Kong was uh, it, at the Universal Studios tour. With, oh. with the King Kong encounter, which back then, this would have been in the, in the 80s, I think. Um, it was part of the studio. It wasn't a ride by itself. It was part, you, like you were on a tram, you know, going around to, the, to see the different sets. So they're like, over here is where they, this is the town square from Back to the Future and whatnot. And then the, and then the tram, you know, turns a corner and goes into a big, studio and a uh, set that's like looks like New York City at night and it's like you hear police sirens and there's you know TV news um, blaring stuff something about a monster and you turn a corner and you're on a bridge and there's a giant robot 30 foot ape rocking the bridge and it's so close that it's like you can I remember you could feel the breath from the, from the oh, ape, wow. you know, and it's like right up in your face and it's roaring and there's fire. And I was really, I was really amazed at that. It really, it, it, I mean, it didn't look real to me, but it looked really cool. Yeah. <laughs> it was by far the coolest uh, theme park ride attraction I had ever seen. And I had that same vacation. I had gone, also gone to, to Disney. <laughs> so it was way cooler than anything at Disney. And, uh, and the, then that same summer is when I had uh, I was at the video store and I saw King Kong lives at the on the VHS rack, and I was like, "Got to see that movie because now I'm I'm into you know finding out what King Kong is about." And boy, did I find out! <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Oh. <laughs> uh. Yeah, I did eventually see all the movies, but you know later when I was in my in my you know I have to see everything that was ever made phase. Right. Yeah, I remember AMC when it was still American Movie Classics showed it. I, I think I saw it there and not Turner Classic. Um, and I, I remember I was maybe a junior in high school when I finally saw the original 33 Kong. 
And I kind of knew what to expect. What I wasn't expecting was how good it was. Like how good the effects were. Like I was like, it's going to be an older movie. At this point I'd seen older movies and I was like, you know, how much can they really have done, you know, at this point? And it turns I out was, hot. yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was, and I was into it. I was yeah. watching it, you know, by myself. Um, and I, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've seen it since I've seen it on the big screen. They happened to have shown it uh, here in Austin about 10, 12 years ago. Um, I still saw it at the Ritz. Um, uh, it, you know, and I, I loved it. And then it was funny when the 2005 Kong was coming out or had come out. I, I remember going to go see that and people were like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't really know what that was. Like it had all these dinosaurs in it. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's Kong. And they're <laughs> that's like, Kong. that's yeah. Kong. And I'm like, yeah, that's always King Kong's always been full of dinosaurs. And they're like, what? I knew, I knew there was like a weird Island. And I was like, yeah, it was weird because it was full of dinosaurs. <laughs> 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 so that's the point of the movie. Well, the seventies stripped the dinosaurs out. And I think right? that was it. Yeah. So, I mean, but that was kind of like the, the thing about, uh, 1970s, 1980s sci-fi is, it seemed to, in, in many cases, at least, a lot of stuff that was interpreting older things, um, it was like, this isn't your father's Oldsmobile kind of version, and it's like, we're going to make a serious version, and we're going to take out the silly, because, of course, you know, you came for a, a 30-foot ape, but you wouldn't believe that there's also dinosaurs on the island, so... We're going to take that out. And it's, and it was, it struck me as the same kind of sensibility as like, well, we're going to take out all the, all the, the cool, you know, um, the super pets and whatnot and Superboy from Superman, the movie and, you know, and that kind of thing where, where they're just stripping things down to the most, um, I don't know, uh, the, the bare, the, the, the bare bones of the concept to kind of make it more, um, I don't know, streamlined and I guess palatable to a, a, an adult, uh, sophisticated audience, if you will. I don't know. I mean, I think that definitely, I mean, I was wondering about this as I was watching it and kind of going like, cause it was the first one I watched when on this circle of viewings and was like, well, it's De Laurentiis who can do a lot on not much money. Always. That's kind of been his hallmark, but, um, or could he just not afford it? And so they leaned into it to do that because you're right. Like it's a long movie. They still have the giant snake though. They still have the giant they're, snake. They're, they're willing, they're willing to go giant snake and they're willing to go giant ape, but that's where we'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> Everything else about this Island is just basically, it looks like Hawaii. Right. And I would, right. Yeah, yeah it, exactly. Um, and I was and like, I well, what did they what did they fill the time with? And I was like, well, they filled they filled it with stuff that is not. It, it's when you kind of get that pivot from the thirty three version of King Kong and Darrow does not really have a relationship with Kong. No, not at all. She's just afraid of him. Yeah, which yeah. I mean, and understandably so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, but but that not, since you mentioned that, yeah, that since I, you know, since I grew up on. 70s Kong first to me that was always kind of a, a core part of the story is not just that he he takes the girl wh- whichever you know human it is he's he's relating to in, in the story at the time but that she then returns some affection to him and and begins to you know to care what happens to him and is sad when you know he, he gets shot down and so going back and seeing the original uh, at, at one point I, I remember thinking, Oh wow, this is kind of a, a stark contrast where she's just like, Oh, get the brood away from me, you know? And her only real reaction to him is ever fear. Yeah. The famous Fay Ray scream. Yeah. Right. Right. Whereas you have Jessica Lang, you know, who's, who's, you know, throwing herself, throwing her body in between the bullets and the ape, you know, no, they won't shoot you if you're holding me. So keep holding me, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's kind of what I was used to and what, you know, the, Peter Jackson kept that sort of aspect in. Oh, and, and he, he way the hell leaned into it. Yeah. And, yeah. And absolutely leaned into it. And um, even more than that, I thought I, I liked that Jackson added um, it, it, like he added a reason for Kong to sort of 
uh, have an affection for her. You know, he, he added with the vaudevillian stuff, I thought mm-hmm. it was interesting because until then it's always just been like, you know, Kong takes the offering because that's, she's offered. <laughs> she's, 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 she's kind of presented to him as you get the idea that, you know, sacrificial women are brought out and this is the new one. And so he takes her because that's what he does. And then I guess the idea is that she fights back, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in the seventies Kong, she's like, Hey, you can't eat me. And she and she calls him a, a, you know, a chauvinist pig or something like that, you know? And, and, and so in that version, it's like, Oh, it's her audacity that he likes. But I really liked in, in Jackson Kong. And that the, the thing that, that really set it apart for me was the whole bit of she, she entertained him. Right. He thought she made him laugh. He thought she was funny. And that's why he wanted to keep her around <laughs> that maybe until then he'd never really regarded uh, people as, um, you know, I don't know, fellow, any, anything that, that he could uh, relate to. It was just another creature. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But here's someone he can relate to. And I, I like that aspect of it. Yeah. And it, yeah. And there's, there's a, a ton there to unpack with, with the kind of the, the much more fleshed out version of Anne. Um, of, of her, you know, wanting to be a comedian and everyone keeps telling her how sad she is all the time. Yeah. And finally she gets a laugh out of someone and it's a 30 freaking foot eight. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> but um, she proves that she proves that she has those comedy chops that nobody believes. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, yeah they was, have this. That was really cool. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's deft, smart writing. Um, you know, I think one of the things unfortunately about that version is Jackson, couldn't kind of leave well enough alone. Like Jamie and I were watching the original Kong and like the, the, there's tons of monster fights in the original Kong. Like after he has Anne in one hand, it's just scene after scene of, Oh God, there's the T-Rex and now there's the you know pterodactyl <laughs> yeah, yeah. and now there's the snake and now that, and it's all fun. It's all, you know, interesting stuff, but it, but it's all also partially because of you know, the limitations of the technology, you know, fairly brief fight scenes. The T-Rex one is probably the one that goes on the longest. Um, but in Jackson's version, I mean, I can tell you he lost me at the <laughs> the charging of the dinosaurs, of the brontosaurus. Yeah. But it was yeah. interesting too to go, okay, well this is, this is supposed to be filling in the place of them on the boat in the original movie, cr- crossing the water and having a bad time with the meat eating brontosaurus that that's there. It's like, okay, well, everyone knows now that a brontosaurus is a veggie source, right? So, you know, we can't do that. So what, what can we do? Well, we, we can do this like stampede that's going to last for apparently 10 minutes. Um, but why, but why 10 minutes? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like that should have been <laughs> then, like yeah. 10 seconds. Um, no, that was the first. So King Kong was before the Hobbit movies. And was mm-hmm. really the first indication that Peter Jackson had kind of lost all concept of pacing to me because there's just, there's great stuff. There's really, really great stuff in that movie, but gosh, it just, it's boring. <laughs> it's still so boring. Like I, I, I literally fell asleep. I was watching the movie uh, this time and I fell asleep shortly after she got on the boat and I woke up right before Kong comes crashing out of the, jungle and i got a pretty good nap i mean i (laughs) and i felt and i didn't really feel like i needed to you know rewind it or anything i was like nope this is fine i I was actually uh (laughs) this is beneficial to my viewing to have skipped ahead (laughs) and yeah there's so many sequences like the like the stampede and the 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 giant insects is another one it just goes on and on and on yeah and even the t-rex fight where I, i appreciate it on the level of the of like the, the, they live um, fight where it's funny because it's so, it goes on for so long that it becomes funny, but I don't know if that was really intentional. No, there's no way that was intentional. (laughs) Yeah. And, and and the insects thing too. I mean, so the insects thing was famously uh, supposed to be in the original Kong and never got actually filmed or got cut or no one's really sure. Uh, But there's evidence that there was supposed to have been this scene where, they were fighting bugs down in this valley and 
Jackson re- decided to restore it and um, it just goes and it's painful to watch. It just goes on and on and on. Um, and you just didn't need it. I mean, cause it, it takes place immediately after the guys all fall off the tree branch when Kong's shaking them loose into the little Valley. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just not a required scene. It, I understand the why they cut it. The tree branch still looks good by the way. I mean, I watched it just the other day and still looks good in 2020. Mm-hmm. A lot of the stuff still looks good. The Brontosaurus stuff still looks good. Mm-hmm. When Kong brings her into his cave, that's that's beautiful. I yeah. mean, there's 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 so many um, frames of that movie that are just art. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, not to be pretentious about it, but I mean, it just it's still kind of unmatched. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. And there was so much stuff that he did where, you know, just even expanding on, on that stuff, like the cave obviously is meant to mimic the kind of cool cave that um, was in the original film. And um, you know, the same thing of it's this kind of cathedral like cave you pass through. And then it has this kind of like platform that looks out over skull Island. Um, And, you know, we have the problem with the pterodactyl and, you know, both movies, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful looking movie and the parts in New York, I think also look absolutely gorgeous. Um, we, what we haven't talked about much is kind of the, the Carl Denham, uh, character and kind of the, the setup for, uh, all of the films. And, uh, interestingly, I was reading up a little bit about the, the guy who, actually directed Kong and, and kind of wrote Kong, uh, Miriam. Um, and you'll see two names associated with it. And I was reading yesterday. I don't know if this is true or not. Someone correct me that Miriam was basically this like test pilot slash adventure movie <laughs> maker slash just this like really intense guy. And at some point he had the idea for the idea of Kong. We didn't really know how to write a screenplay. And uh, RKO was like, okay, uh, well, we have this mystery writer in England on contract and we want you to work with him. And so he sat down with him and they hashed some stuff out. And a week later, Cooper was dead. Like he just dropped dead. And, but Miriam was like, no, I'm going to keep his name on it. He helped me out essentially. So it looks like he did all this input and, but, he basically turned around with what they did and handed it to two guys who had are, are listed as the people who are, who are the screenwriters. And then there's a woman, I think her name is Ruth Rose, who is also listed as a screenwriter. She actually wrote the shot script. Those guys each got paid thousands of dollars to work on the movie. She was paid 150 bucks for cleanup. <laughs> yeah. But she's the one who essentially wrote the final draft of Kong that that's on screen is at least apocryphally, you know, what I, so, what I read, but I, it, it's, it, but anyway, what I was going to say is he's a lot like Miriam was a lot like Denim himself. Like this. Yeah, like, absolutely. That's, dude. that's always been my read is that, yeah, Marion C. Cooper is Carl Denham. I mean, it's, a, it's an avatar of him. And, and as far as the, the script, uh, I, you know, it's, it's been, it went through so many hands with so many different people claiming responsibility that it's hard to say anymore mm-hmm. who really wrote it. And the other thing is that I've always read is that it was, you know, pretty much rewritten as it was being filmed constantly, as a lot of films were, mm-hmm. um, with um, Cooper, you know, constantly, um, trying to up the ante as far as the monsters and as far as the adventure aspect and, and, and whatnot. And, uh, what I had read was that, uh, the co-director Ernest Shodsack, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Shodsack was basically, I mean, he was, he was there to do the people, right? Okay. He, you know, <laughs> he was in charge of, of you know shooting the scenes with the people on the boat and the actors interacting with each other and Cooper was more uh, there for the 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 action right okay and it was he was the one that came up with the idea of you know the the, the of the, of the giant ape to begin with and originally it was supposed to be a a Komodo dragon I think that he was fighting instead of a T Rex but you know as things went on everything just got bigger and bigger in scope um, I think. 
it wasn't originally the Empire State Building until he was in New York City and he saw the Empire State Building. He says, that's the building we have to use because it's just so dynamic, you know. And, um, but yeah, yeah, he, he totally is, he totally is uh, Carl Denham. And w- which makes it a little weird watching the movie to me because Carl Denham is completely a villain to me. And I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if that's a self-conscious or unselfconscious choice, right? Because Carl Denham basically creates the the by in, in the same way uh, that Marion Cooper is creating is combining all these exploitive things that that audiences will love in the real world, right? Denham does the same thing in the movie, and the result is tragedy. Yeah. Right. And so I'm like, does he realize that he's commenting on himself? <laughs> Is the movie realize that it's commenting on? I don't think that it does, but it still kind of works that way as, as, yeah. you, know, you know, what, what we would call like meta commentary today, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's all about um, <sighs> destroying the thing that you are trying to create or destroying the thing that you love. Um, and that's, I think, one of the one of the things about it that makes it so memorable, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think yes, absolutely. Um, I, I think that that works on on you know all all of the different versions kind of play with that idea on, on different levels. Um, and we haven't even talked about Skull Island too, but maybe we can do that as kind of like a <laughs> an addendum, and then you know, Sun or Kong lives. But um, yeah, I mean, he. In, in both the 2005 version and, and, and I feel like the 2005 version has tons of meta commentary on the original film. That's much more baked into, you know, Peter Jackson's self-awareness. He's working with Philippa. What's her name on, you know, but it's all, it's, it's all, I mean, it was all too obvious to me, but it's cause you know, the, you know? yeah, yeah. Because, it, it, it definitely mean, it, was a, like, you know, the movie, so do we, we're going to talk about it as well, you're watching the movie. Every time something happens, something bad happened to someone, uh, it, Carl Denham now played by Jack Black stops, stops the movie almost to talk to the camera and say, I feel guilty about what just happened, but I'm going to keep going. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to finish the movie for, for this, for that dead guy, you know? <laughs> Yeah, but he, he never does that means multiple it. times. But he never means it. I don't. It's, it's just what he said. Well, he's yeah, but he's. I feel like he's he's convincing himself. Yeah. At the same time, he's convincing them. But he totally forgets you know? every time that he's. And just so done that. when he says at the end, you know, it was beauty killed the beast, which is yeah. that, that, that something they repeat a few times in the original. I think they only say it the one time in the in the remake. I'm always like, does he realize it wasn't her? It was him. Does he realize that when he's saying it? Or is he still trying to convince himself the same way he's trying to convince himself all those times he said, I'm going to finish the movie for that guy. You know, I, I can't I, really I think, tell. I, I, I think that that's a really good question. Um, one of the things I noticed on this viewing was, so they have the, the Arabian, supposed Arabian proverb of, um, you know, he found beauty and from that day was like one dead, right? Yeah. And one of the things that happens in the 2005 version that's unique to that one is Andero calling King King. When she comes back, she's not okay. Right. Yeah. She's not participating. She's done with Jack. She's I thought just that like was living. a good change too, by the way, yeah, that she but, would not, that she wouldn't agree to be part of the show. Uh, yeah. I thought it was, you know, they've created a new, you know, I think better version of Andero. I mean, yeah. I love Fay Ray, but yeah. Um, and I think she is the one it, referring to the Ara- Arabian proverb of she is the one who is now dead. Oh. Hmm. I, and I think, so I'm going to go through what I think happens to the various Anderos. Okay, sure. <laughs> Dwan, I think that there's a weird thing about pursuit of fame and fortune in the seventies version where Dwan represents the blind pursuit of stardom and uh, Groden's character, whose name I cannot remember at the moment represents blind greed and, and pursuit of power. And I think it's interesting 
that the minute that Kong breaks loose in that one, Groden gets squished. Yeah. He doesn't make it to the end. He doesn't have any commentary at the end. The commentary in the end of the 76 Kong. So she has this whole thing of like, you know, she and Jack aren't sure they're going to make it. And that's Jeff Bridges in that version playing a, a, uh, apologist. Um, a primatologist and she, but she is the kind of, yeah, she, (laughs) but she's the kind of like 1970s, you know, rubbing crystals, like, you know, are you a Libra? I'm a Libra, you know, sort of like, um, she's extremely flaky, extremely flaky. And absolutely. But everyone's forgiving her because she's so beautiful, right? She's Jessica Lang in her first role. And, um, and I, I think, you know, people are like, oh, she's such a dingbat. I'm like, Jessica Lang's not a dingbat. That's acting people. <laughs> like, she is acting like one of these people for the sake of this role. Um, so you get her at the very end of the movie. Kong's dead in the middle between the Twin Towers. She runs down. They must have magic elevators all of a sudden because she's, she's suddenly down there. She was suddenly, yeah, they cut and she's down there. And I'm like, holy yeah. crap. <laughs> and all of the cameras turn yeah. from this magnificent animal that's laying dead in the middle between the twin towers and all of the cameras swarm her. Right. And that's what she gets for stardom. That's her stardom. That's her star moment. Now she's a star. Now she's a star. Now she everyone knows she wanted, who she yeah. is. Yeah. And that's like, she's yelling. She is screaming for Jack at that point. And he right. just stops and he's like, Nope, she's yeah. a star now. Um, it's really interesting and because it, it's, it, it's much more subtle than what they do in the 2005 version in a lot of ways to me, because it's a, a lot of stuff of like when they're in the bar trying to figure out, like they're hiding out. She's like, buy me a drink, Jack, buy me a drink. And they, the bar has been cleared out. Um, he's talking to her. She's spending the whole time looking in the mirror, putting on her fur. <laughs> right. <laughs> Like she's still, still like, self, I'm not sure. Like, obsessed. Yeah. Yeah. Like do I, you know, he's offering me, I keep saying I want to be with him, but you know, but she's also at the same time has the same pull towards Kong who kind of represents this possibility for stardom. And, you know, um, cause that's the thing that separated to him in the, in the seventies version, Jack's the one who's taken off and been like, I can't be a part of this. You know, you guys are being unethical. Um, so I think it's, 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 you know, they, you know, these different eras have these different takes. And I think even Kong lives attempts some of that, but they're, you know, they're trying to reverse the genders. You know, we have the, you know, Linda Hamilton shows up as the, the scientist and she's, um, but you know, it's just not, <laughs> it's just Kong lives. Well, I, It's I just feel a like, goofy movie. I feel like the, the female lead in each film gets more agency as, time progresses right Mm -hmm. so i mean in the original kong she's as much a captive almost as he is i mean she doesn't really she she doesn't choose to be there Mm -hmm. right i mean uh she she was she she was brought to the ship because she was caught stealing she was stealing because it's a depression she can't get work Mm -hmm. right so everything that happens to her is kind of out of her control and you know i i i didn't I, again, I don't know if it's intentional, but I felt like the, you know, the imagery of her being kind of strapped up on display uh, as a sacrifice, you know, presented to the, to the ape um, mirrored when Kong himself was strapped up as a captive, you know? Oh, interesting. So, but as each, as each version progresses, you know, like Anne in 2005, um, she chooses to go find him, Right. Mm-hmm. If if she hadn't got in, in in the original, it's by some magic coincidence that he was able to find her, which is fine. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, and uh, but by by two thousand five, she's now. If she hadn't looked for him, he never would have found her, right? Yeah. So I I I like that. I like that. Um, I like that she has more agency and she has more more. Um, it's more about the personality of these two characters that are more like stuck in a place that they're, they're both stuck in a place they didn't want to be. <laughs> and, you know, it's almost like a meet cute, like a romantic comedy. Right. Yeah. Um, that it's, that's come to be, uh, I don't know, almost, 
I, I, I wish there was more of that in the original now as I go back to it. But I still really love the imagery, the mirror imagery of, the t- of her as captive and Kong as captive, you know, mm-hmm. in the same way. Neither one, of them, neither one of them chose to be there. They were both brought there against their will, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's – I completely agree. I didn't necessarily put it that way in my own head, but, yeah, I agree with you now for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the Andero of the original um, – you know, is, you know, famously Fay Ray who did, you know, was popular at the time and, and, um, you know, managed to, I think, eat out for free on being you know, and Darrow for the rest of her life after this. Right. It's hard. It's hard to talk about like what a gigantic movie this was when it came out. And I want to, I want to contextualize a little bit because we talked a little bit about kind of historically what was going on, um, at the time Well, you said like, you know, uh, Cooper went to New York, saw the Empire State Building. Empire State Building is brand new at this point. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. So it's, um, it's, it's taking something primitive and bringing it to something modern. Yeah. And it's, shockingly it's the most modern, modern of modern right. things. Yeah. And, and it would have looked just as, it would have looked, shock, as you say, shockingly modern to the audience at the time. Mm-hmm. The, yeah. the little spire at the top that you see in it, um, that is a Zeppelin uh, landing. People were supposed to come oh, to the yeah, Empire yeah, that's State right. Building yeah, and yeah, and yeah. basically some somehow get and walk this, over and yeah. walk over, yeah, yeah. So um, you know, then you had the Hindenburg and all that fun ended, but the spire <laughs> was still there. Yeah. Um, but that's why there actually are all those ladders and all the glass and 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 this weird this weird structure that's that's there. Um, now it now it just looks like something. I mean, out of times past. Uh, you know, like our art deco architecture. I mean, it just, it's, it still looks cool, but it doesn't look futuristic anymore. No. You know? Right. Yeah. It, it, it looks like a, the, yeah, that art deco uh, era um, that the people want to kind of still associate with New York when they think classic New York. And you think about how much that, that movie probably imprinted New York on, you know, I mean, New York was always shown in movies, certainly during this period, but it was usually like, let's look at the lights of Broadway. Like there weren't a lot yeah, of like, yeah. we're going to get in an airplane and fly around and you're going to actually see this sprawling metropolis when you're sitting in, you know, Podunk, Texas. Um, and, and you know, your town of like, you know, 25,000 people or whatever it was, it was just hard for people to imagine. But one of the things I find really interesting is gorillas. They first heard about them in like the 16th or 17th century from someone, some Portuguese guys, no one actually, no Westerner or rather European saw a gorilla until like 1857, something like that. So even rare, they're, they're rare. And they were in the middle of, you know, Rwanda, which was not easy to get to. Um, no one had no one had seen a mountain gorilla until 1904 or 1905, something like that. So you're talking about like 30 years, basically, between people finding out something even existed and this movie kind of coming out. And before this, gorillas are mostly like a legend. They're like there's these hairy men running around, you know, who who if you get too close to them, they get kind of violent. So don't go near the hairy men. Well, and also I think uh, relevant is it's before, you know, Google maps had, had mapped out every single inch of the earth. Mm-hmm. Right. And we had satellites that could look down and see everything. And so it was a lot more plausible to think that there's just some lost Island out there that has who knows what in it. That's been mm-hmm. separated from everything for all time. And who knows what's there? I mean, it seems completely plausible. And especially if you combine it with, Oh, this rare, animal that you know people are peripherally aware of but it's this sort of almost mythical beast you know sort of sort of human-like but not really uh yeah it's all very mysterious and and kind of cool yeah well and i mean i so you know there's of course now the the completely reasonable discourse about we were riffing on the word discourse earlier today sorry (laughs) um but it, it if there's this you know, the the reasonable discourse about presentation of the natives of Skull Island across the various versions. Um, 
I'm probably more charitable about why people had those impressions than, than probably, you know, a a 20 something tweeter might be right now. Um, But I think a lot of it comes out of that 1930s era. Like you said, the world wasn't mapped. We're still discovering things. People don't know anything about Antarctica at this point. Right. Um, You have no idea what's sitting, you know, in, in the jungles of Africa. You know, these are, these are the things that people are filling in the blanks with tales of like mystery and suspense and, there could be anything in there. Cause every time we go in there, we find something completely wild. You know, there's a giant snake. We call a Python. We pulled that out of there. Um, you know, the first time someone sees a platypus in Australia, right? I mean, all of these things are kind of this air mystery. You have also, it's also kind of this beginning you're coming off, um, kind of this era of spiritualism of, of, uh, you know, mystics and, and like, you know, fortune tellers and all this stuff that like Houdini was always trying to like, you know, get rid of and like, let's be reasonable. I'm going to, you know, get rid of all the mystics. Um, and you're coming into this. Yeah. You're coming to this era of science of people of reason <laughs> yeah. now. Right. So yeah, yeah. Um, science, science has its own kind of mysticism about it. Yeah. And so, you know, you are we're valuing, you know, the idea of exploration, all that, but we're not thinking of it at this point as colonialism equals bad. We're not at this point thinking of it as we're thinking of it as civilization is entering into these unknown territories with people who we meet when we meet them, they're exotic and strange. Uh, Right. So, well, it's, I mean, it's hard to watch this movie in, in 2020 while this, this week, this month, we're still dealing with the negative legacy of colonialism and slavery, right? Mm -hmm. In this country, like in the news. And I'm watching this movie and and it's about a group of white people sailing across the ocean and conquering the uncivilized world and bringing back something in chains to be sold and used and exploited. And it's, it's difficult to, to watch that and not, see that as that this movie is it's uncomfortable to while it's uncomfortable to see the way the natives are depicted i guess it's it's also a movie that's hugely reflective of america's kind of racial history and rather than because i, I feel like a lot of the movies at the time black people just weren't in them at all right? They just weren't present. Right. Yeah. And so very very white, white people are making movies about stories white people want to tell to themselves. Right. And so this is an unapologetically racist depiction of the Island natives. But at the same time, it's kind of like, well, and, and it's uncomfortable to watch, but at least it's there. And at least it's like, it, it shows, uh, it kind of forces you to reckon with that, that history of, um, you know, this country kind of, you know, going into these places and pillaging them and bringing out whatever riches uh, they wanted and then having to deal with the consequences, which were disastrous. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I mean, when I say I'm I'm charitable about seeing this stuff, it's because I'm not, I, I, I believe that was the thinking at the time but looking at it now, it's exactly what you said. It's it's um, it's hard not to see it as a modern parable about those things and and about our own psychotic um, concerns about anyone who is not a white man touching a white woman. Yeah, I think honestly, I, I think if you made if somebody made King Kong, or the original Kong, the thirty three Kong today and made it the same way and released it today, it would be seen as a satire. It would be seen as a satire about colonialism, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which I don't think was its intention at the time. Again, just like I don't think that, you know, Cooper was aware that the movie that he made was was commenting on his, you know, his, uh, his own exploitation, right? Um, but yet there it is. And so uh, that's part of what I think has made the, the, the story survive and, and stay interesting. And 
I, I guess it's like, um, for me, Kong is not, uh, it's not something that I can have like simple opinions about, like on a surface level. Oh yeah, I like that. Or I don't like it. It's, I have, I have, there are lots of things I like about it. There are lots of things that make me uncomfortable. There's some things I don't like about it, but, but on the whole, it's still, it seems like an important thing to, to watch and an important thing to acknowledge, you know, as part of our history, not just, his, not just as part of American history, part of our cultural history, part of film history. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I think that's another reason that, that the, that the stories of the characters have survived. Yeah. And I think it's why they try and adapt them every, you know, every, I guess every 30 or 40 years to try and reconcile, you know, what, what this means, what does it mean now? It's interesting that, you know, and I don't, I don't blame Jackson for doing a retro story because it is, as you say, like would be very difficult post, you know, satellite photography to understand how you could have a missing Island or, uh, yeah, how you can't, we can't really tell these same stories today uh, and, and make it make any sense. And, um, like yeah, even the, 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 well, the ways, the ways that they have the Island hidden in each successive version is, I mean, it becomes more and more complex and comical because, you know, it's not, and not just that the, the technology has improved with the time. So there would no longer be any hidden islands, but it's also that the, you know, the audience um, has is aware of those things <laughs> too, and so now by the time you get to Skull, Kong Skull Island, it's like the island is is surrounded by a perpetual storm, you know, mm-hmm. and it's like this, it's like a super storm, and I'm like, boy, I, I'm pretty sure we would have seen that, we would have noticed that, <laughs> you know, for hundreds of years, everyone said, don't sail there. I, yeah, um, I mean, it looks like it. I mean, when they and when they go into the storm, I mean, this is a serious storm. This looks like that, you know, the the which, by the way, uh, completely disappears once you're on the island. And right, exactly, and it's and you got clear <laughs> skies, right? I'm like, so, yeah, it, it, it's it's come and what was but it? it's, it's also Kong, set in an era as soon as you have satellite photography, right? It's like yeah. the minute you have it, they're like, okay, have, yeah, no, that that did kind of make sense. So it's like we finally had our satellites go over the area, and we saw there's an island there, so we need to go there. And so that gave them at least an excuse to go there. Yeah. Yeah. And that was kind of like, well, this is about the latest date we think we can do this movie. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like <laughs> if we do it like 1985 or something, it's, it doesn't make sense anymore. Um, I did think that the, in, uh, speaking of Skull Island uh, and the depictions of the natives, I thought that the de- depictions of the natives in Skull Island was, I guess the, the I don't want to say the best, but the most, humanizing <laughs> of all the films because I mean, in every version, the natives basically have no part other than they're an obstacle, right. To the, to the, the main characters, um, except in skull Island, it's, they, they just kind of, they're just kind of there and they just, they're there to provide backstory and exposition. Like uh-huh. we've been living, we've been living with these monsters and we've created these, you know, cave paintings of them. So we can tell you what's been going on. But other than that, we're not going to try and stop you. We're not going to try and offer up one of you, you know, to the monsters or anything. Uh, we're just here for exposition purposes and that's fine. <laughs> the exposition people. The exposition natives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, yeah. No, it, it's true. It, it, I was wondering how they were going to handle it because Jackson got kind of clonked over the head for what he did which I thought what he did was actually kind of interesting, which was he took a wide range of different people of different, you know, ethnic backgrounds. And then was like, by the way, they all cover themselves in this ash. So uh, we can't really tell what anybody looks like anyway. And, but clearly that person's like, if you look at her, she's clearly European and this, this lady's clearly not, you know, um, so, and when you have an island that's like a vortex Bermuda Triangle in the middle of, of the ocean, I was like, okay, I can see if you're sitting around trying to figure out how can we do this without doing the original King Kong or doing what they did in the 70s, you know, what, what, what are you going to do? Um, and that's part of what makes the story so hard, I think, to retell at this point. I don't, by the way, on a rewatch, consider Kong Skull Island 
to even really be a King Kong movie. It's, it's its own thing. I mean, <laughs> it, it, the first time I saw it, I, it so confused me. I had so much like cognitive dissonance. I walked out not liking the movie because I was just like, Oh crap, man. They're just doing kind of a weirdo horror version of just the skull Island part. Like I, there's no Brie Larson, like, you know, winding up in New York, running around with this Kong. Like that doesn't happen in this, this story. So and, that well, the alternate um, IMAX poster that I have in my basement from Kong skull Island that I just, you know, the, the, the theater was throwing away is, a riff on a, the apocalypse now poster. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's, and it's a, and it's a giant, you know, Kong head with the, with the helicopters and the sunset. And I mean, to me, it's, if you go in just thinking of it like that, of the movie, like the poster, this is, this is Kong, you know, in apocalypse now. Uh, and, you know, Kong is like this really heavy handed metaphor for, for war. Right. And it's, it's the thing that the, the, the American soldier, you know, can't let go, right? He has to, he has to keep going. Even, the, even in, in the face of defeat, he's still going to keep going because he's obsessed, you know, in the same way we kind of, uh, the country kind of gets uh, uh, morassed in, in war. Um, you know, it, it, I thought it was heavy handed, but it was, it was still kind of fun. And I thought it was beautifully shot. Of all the Kong movies, I thought Skull Island was the best. It's the for me uh, since the original. It's the best to look at because they actually put some thought into I mean, the 2005 Kong. It has some nice shots in it if you if you freeze frame them, <laughs> but the whole thing just has such an air of green screenness about it that it's like. It's it. Every, I never really believe that they're on an island. I don't believe they're on a boat. I mean, everything just seems so artificial. Yeah, there's a weird sheen to it that I, I can't quite get my head around. It's got that same, you know, Star Wars Episode One kind of feel to it, where I just yeah, every everybody looks like they just walk off stage, left, even though they're on in you know in the jungle. It just looks so. It doesn't. It doesn't look right to me. It doesn't look. I can't feel the texture of the jungle. You know, there's not. I don't know. I, I, I can't put my finger on the quality to it. It's too digital. It's too artificial. Yeah. But Kong Skull Island, I mean, there are, there are some beautiful shots in that movie. I mean, it's, it's kind of ridiculous um, and, and really silly, but there are moments that I just really enjoy watching, especially the first appearance uh, of Kong with the helicopters when he takes out that you know, whole um, uh, troop of helicopters. That, that's a that really cool scene. Yeah, um, I'm much. More, I felt much more charitable towards the movie watching it again, knowing kind of don't go in anymore expecting that you know they're they're basically making a two part Kong movie, which is kind of what I thought the first time I saw this saw Skull Island. I was like, oh, they're gonna do like Kong Skull Island, and then they're gonna do Kong Takes New York or something like. Right. <laughs> um, but. Uh, now that I know kind of what to expect, I'm like, okay. And you're right. Yeah. It's, it's definitely beautifully shot. It has some really well-crafted stuff in there. Um, I wish it did more with the characters, especially uh, Brie Larson's character. Cause I didn't really know who she was when I saw it. I didn't really understand like, Oh, she's like a really powerful actor. You know, like I was yeah. like, she's, she's the lady in the tank top who takes pictures. Got it. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Um, and she's she's going to be the kind of you know voice of anti-war you know whatever and we've got but not forcefully enough to make a difference. Uh uh-uh. uh no I mean it doesn't yeah. feel like yeah um, and, and there's too for- many characters with too many POVs to to the point where none of no one stands out except for Samuel L Jackson Samuel Jackson yeah right and you kind of know how he's going to end from the minute he starts going on the path he's on because we've all seen that movie right exactly <laughs> so. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of its own weird, weirdo little thing, which is fine. Cause they're trying to fit it in with the monster verse movies, uh, the, the legendary, uh, Toho stuff. Um, but it's, it, it just is such a, a, you know, any, any reflecting back on the Andero stuff felt kind of forced in the end. 
Um, cause like, even like when she has her moment with him where she first sees him and they just kind of look at each other and she's not attacking him. So they tried to compress everything into like 30 seconds. Yeah. 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 And I think maybe I was in the men's room when I saw <laughs> and that happened in the theater the first so you time. Missed the whole, so I missed, you missed like, the whole thing. Yeah. That's funny. Um, so I was like, okay, well, he really seems concerned about her like later in the movie. I was like, okay, I guess that's a thing. So how, um, how do you, how do you feel about the, the a- activist female lead as Brie Larson in Kong Skull Island versus the activist female lead as of Linda Hamilton in well, uh, King Kong? Linda Hamilton will always get bonus <laughs> points in my book. Um, so I think Linda Hamilton is far and away the best thing about Kong lives, but that's not saying a lot. Like don't, <laughs> don't, don't go in there thinking, well, Linda Hamilton. Yes, of course. That's the pull quote they're going to put on their phone. <laughs> right. I mean, so when I was a child, <laughs> and I, the best thing about this. <laughs> when I saw, when I saw the movie as a child and I would have been like, I can't remember like fourth grade, something like that with my brother. I remember during the romance scene, <laughs> The Kong on Kong romance scene, by the way, where the humans decide they're turned on or something. <laughs> um, I turned to my brother and was like, this movie's not very good, I think. And the, you're, you're at that age, like, you like everything. You're just excited to be at the movie and have a box of candy. And a, you know, <laughs> I'm still that way. <laughs> and, but I just, I remember turning to my brother and being like, I, I don't think this is very good, right? Uh, when he's but, offering her the Kong goes to Lady Kong and offers her some what trees or something. I and she's like yeah. and she's playing hard to get. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, like the puppetry is like really pretty good. Like it's they, not bad, but the, the the I mean the suits don't look when when they're in close up they look okay. But when when they pull back and you see the whole scene and it's him, you know, awkward with the with the ape body language of him awkwardly trying to sidle up next to her and her be acting all shy and batting her eyes and stuff. It's just, it's just hilarious. But, but, but wonderful. Hilariously <laughs> wonderful. I wish, I honestly <laughs> wish the movie were just like tilted a little bit worse. Cause then at least <laughs> like straight up, it would have more camp value. I will say this. I really liked the heart transplant scene. I, I legit, unironically like the heart transplant scene. I love that because uh, I love the way that it's shot so that you can't see all of Kong and Uh the movie opens that way. And I thought it was a really strong opening. Yeah. Well, first of all, actually, so sorry, it doesn't open that. It opens with a recap of 70 of the ending of seventies Kong where they condense that 10 minute sequence where he's being shot at and talking to, um, uh, Jessica Lang and her coming back to him and her him pushing her away and her coming back to him again and her pushing him away and cut back to Jeff Bridges looking concerned again and they cut all that down to like 30 seconds and it still completely tells the whole story yeah. and it made me realize that man they really this should have been the end of the movie <laughs> because they cut out all that fat but so then after that it goes to okay now, now you know Kong is dead oh big step wait here is the body and he's still breathing and, and you see it only in like little snippets, almost like, yeah. you know, like a monster movie, right? You know, here's the, you know, part of the head and here's part of the arm and there's the, and you can see the chest moving up and down. There's a scientist moving all around. And when they do the operation, I love the gigantic tools that yeah. they use, you know, the giant buzz saws and stuff instead of a scalpel and the sound effects and the squirting blood everywhere. I, and the, when they come in with the heart and the heart is like the size of a, you know, a VW Beetle or something. <laughs> yeah. It's huge. I just thought that looks really cool. That looks legit cool. Yeah. They, ma- they made that thing. You can see. Yeah. It. Yeah. 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 Then there's a real, I don't know if they made a full size Kong, you know, corpse, but they made at least large pieces of it. They made, um, yeah, they made, they must've made for that movie a few feet and, and hands. And yeah, there were definitely full size props cause they, you know, they, but they then shot as, soon, right around as, as soon as they introduce Lady Kong is where it starts to go awry, <laughs> which is, which is, I think the next scene. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it goes. Yeah. Cause even the guy who they have in it as, as the romantic interest for Linda Hamilton. I mean, the well, guy is no Jeff Bridges. No. Yeah. He was, I don't know. I, I hate to bag on someone. He was a soap actor and, 
there's a reason you never heard about him again after this movie. But, but they um, gave him they gave him Jeff Bridges' hair. The well, same hair. <laughs> the same or, or attempted to. Yeah. The same mane of hair that Jeff Bridges had from the from the <laughs> from seventies yeah. Kong. But yeah, I mean that movie is just it's it's a very um it's very nineteen it seems like a direct video movie to me as I watch it now. Yeah. But uh there's so many shots where I'm, where I'm, I was watching it, you know, a couple of weeks ago, whenever we were first talking about this and so many sh- shots of the, of the apes, you know, and their mating behavior and stuff. And I'm watching and I'm like, why did they think this was good enough to keep this as the final <laughs> shot? I don't understand. Like this looks so bad. I yeah. can't believe this was, you know, 1987 or whatever it was. Well, you know, and talk about, you know, I said earlier, you know, with, with Samuel Jackson's character, you've seen, you've seen this movie before. Well, that's the end of this movie. Yeah. It's the exact same thing of a general. Yeah. Like he has really pers- got an, a vendetta and then Kong becomes his Moby Dick. Yeah. It's yeah. the exact same thing. And there wasn't, it wasn't, I'm trying to think. They did something with charges in this movie too, didn't they? Oh, it was explosives. And that's where I was like, did they get the idea for explosives for Skull Island from this as well? I just remember. So there's a bit where Kong is presumed dead, right? He jumps mm-hmm. off a cliff. He lands in a raging river during a storm and he hits his head and there's blood yeah. in the water. Yeah. And it's weeks later and they haven't recovered a body. And so they presume he's dead. I'm like, he's a 35 foot ape. Where could he be hiding? <laughs> I mean, if nothing else, couldn't you like scan the area for like heat signatures or something? I mean, just vultures, maybe. I mean, something? the amount the amount of wildlife he would clear just by walking around, just by like, you know, I, it just it doesn't it's not plausible that you could just yeah. lose a thirty foot ape in the middle of wherever it was. I think Washington State or something. No, no, they were in North Carolina. North Carolina, okay, yeah. Yeah, I think I think they're in like the Raleigh Durham area. <laughs> But there was, yeah, and I, I hate to, I hate to harp on this, but it's one of those things they always have in movies that this is totally nitpicky. But they're talking about how the university is going to foot like millions of dollars or whatever to get this. That's not guys how <laughs> universities work. That's they right. don't have millions of dollars sitting around that's to go right, buy an like, ape. I've got Harvard on the other line or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's no. <laughs> That's not how that works. Sorry if that if that bursts your illusion of how we're we're rolling things at the university. Anyway, but um it's I wish it were a little campier, but you know, honestly, like Linda Hamilton's like good enough that she kind of isn't campy, so and she's <laughs> kind of the focus character, so um there is some stuff in it that's super campy, not the least of which is that the general and his his Moby Dick, I've gotta get Kong that comes out of nowhere. Like they haven't done anything to establish the character. Um, I was also super thrilled. He's to just see, kind of a dick. Yeah. That's yeah. his motivation. He's a he's dick a, and he's, he's, dick. he's the other cop. And he's Beverly annoyed. Hills cop. Right. Yeah. He's annoyed <laughs> that Kong got away from him and he's not going to get away from me again or whatever. Yeah. That's it. And you see a young Mike star show up. <laughs> like what hasn't Mike star been in? It's always great. <laughs> um, but yeah, thematically, you know, there's, you know, has some of that stuff in there, but mostly it's, it is what it is. There's a reason you haven't seen it. And it was kind of hard to even find. Um, I, they did release it on DVD several years ago. And I think I got like, whoever was, I bought my Kong movies from had like a complete Kong DVD collection. My guess is they upgraded to Blu-ray or something. And I got like all of them for like 15 bucks or something like that. I can attest that there is no King Kong lives on Blu-ray. Because I would, anyway. if it was, after if there this were, podcast, <laughs> <laughs> if there were, I would own it <laughs> because as bad as that movie is, I still have a lot of nostalgia for it. I don't, I don't I, know if I'd seen know. it. I think maybe I watched it once on cable after I saw it in the theater but I, there's no way I'd seen that movie since like early middle school. I had, uh, when I was living overseas, I didn't have very many movies uh, or access to television or, or American pop culture of, of ex- except for when we would make our once a month or every two weeks um, drive to the Navy base. But my dad would send me VHS movies that he copied 
from rentals. And so I had one of my original movies was, and he would send me the stuff I requested. So I, I had King Kong lives on a VHS tape on the back of Howard the Duck. Well, that's, <laughs> that is quite the double and, feature. That's right. <laughs> And I want one day for you to sit your children down and go set aside the next four hours. It's going to be a ride. And so, yeah. And I can attest that I have watched Howard the Duck and King Kong lives back to back more than once <laughs> in LP format on VHS. So it wasn't about very good picture quality. God, that explains so much about you. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, uh, wow. Um, no, I, yeah, it had been a long time. And you know, I'd remember to, it just not being, something I particularly wanted to revisit. So, uh, but you know, I had this kind of like lifelong love from, of Kong from, you know, this, it's just always been around. So of course I wanted to see it when it came out as I always get excited when I see, Oh, they're doing something of Kong. Now so, we didn't, we didn't watch the Japanese Kong versus Godzilla or any of those, or did I you? I haven't watched it recently, but I have seen them. I yeah, I've, I've them. seen it. Yeah. And what I remember from Kong versus Godzilla is they basically redo the story of King Kong in it, shorter, right? But in Japan, right? I don't even he, remember. He, he, I remember the squid. Because I remember the natives and everything. I remember the natives being there and they all, yeah. like, they all like Japanese. Yeah. Um, I don't have, other than that, I don't have a, a super strong memory of Kong versus Godzilla except being really excited at the concept of Kong versus Godzilla as a kid mm -hmm. and watching it and thinking that I was really bored for a long time until they finally got the fight and then really liking the part where, uh, oh, one of them shoves a tree down the other one's throat or something like that. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, there's like and a then, real squid in it. Like they bring in like a real that's squid. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's and and so when the squid thing. showed up in, in Skull Island, I was like, right on, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're calling it back yeah so okay so we were talking about the uh, kong um and its depiction of the natives earlier do you think if they remade kong again today in 2020 or 2021 mm -hmm. is there what would they do with that is there a non-racist non-millennially problematic way to depict the story that would not, you know, blow up on Twitter. No, because at this point there's too much baggage. I was like, well, could you even do it with like, it's a race of, you know, some exotic monster people living there. Well, you're, then you're going to be like, Oh, are you, you know, now you're, now you're making this comparison. You've dehumanized even for, you know, and, and so, yeah. I don't, I don't know. And I'm, you know, again, I agree with those criticisms of the movie, but in trying to like game out how you do it, someone who gets paid more than I do uh, can, can figure it out because I think all of that kind of just comes out of a very different era of, of how we thought of things. And, you know, at the beginning of the 2005 Kong movie, Carl Denham, uh, talks about how everyone can buy a bit of mystery for, you know, the price of a ticket or whatever. Um, and that's not the world we live in now. And I think that was one of the things Peter Jackson was fighting uphill against when he made his version is how do you even show this story to people even by 2005, let alone 2020 um, yeah. in, in a world where we want our, our heroes to be so relatable that they're, you know, they're you flawless. end up with, yeah, you end up with, you know, you end up, well, you end up with, with uh, Batman versus Superman when you try. Oh and, yeah, yeah. 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 And so, um, you know, and, and yes, we also want them to, to hit all these check boxes and not stray and people. And so, you know, when people go back and watch older movies, it's, it can be difficult. I like how you put it as it's uncomfortable and I'm kind of dealing with it as I'm watching it, thinking about that. I think the, the, the thing to take away from that can often be what, what, what was the world? What created this sense with that? Clearly everyone went to go see this movie and had no problem with it. I mean, I'm sure there were people who did, 
um, but you know, by and large, not. One of the things that's interesting about the natives in the original Kong that I really noticed this time, because I was thinking hard about this topic, because it was the last one I watched, um, is at the second half, they actually do a little bit more of a sympathetic portrayal of the, of the natives of they're helping at this point, you know, they're, they're Kong's now invaded their village, mm-hmm. their worst name, why they ever had a gate who can say, um, like just have a little door at the bottom of the wall that he can't get through. Just slide that girl on the, the other side. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which I looked that up finally. I was like, why is there a gate? I Googled it and it said, this is one of the most frequently asked questions about King Kong. I was like, yeah, I, I've watched this movie since, you know, thought of the story since I was like 45 <laughs> years and I never thought of this before watching it. In this case time. you want to like, invite him in for tea. Right. You know? And apparently in like the Peter Jackson novelization, they wrote in a whole thing of saying uh, that the civilization that had built that, that the, all these people kind of fallen from um, had had a bunch of Kongs and they tamed them and they brought them in, you know, the jungle was still full of stuff. So you had to have a wall, but they wanted to get the Kongs in and out of the wall. So they're like war elephants or however they were using them which I was like, sure, whatever you got an excuse for having your gate. But, so, well, but the, anyway, but in the, the original in the, in the, in the, they also show like children in the first one of like, they're going to get harmed in the path of all of this. And um, anyway, I thought it was, I thought it was relatively interesting going back and going, okay, this is clearly, you know, not great. Um, but they also, don't do the thing that movies did back in that day of show black people, something weird happens. They get scared and all run away. That's not (laughs) how they react in this movie. That's all I'll say about it. Do you think it's possible to have a feminist version of Kong? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that the Brie Larson version is about as close as we've seen yet. I would, because one thing I noticed is that you never really find out. I mean, you assume that he that they're offering up these uh, sacrifices, the brides, as sacrifices, and he takes them and he kills them, maybe eats them. Yeah. But you don't really know what happens to them, right? Well, in 2005, you do, because you see all their dead bodies. Oh, you, see the, you see the bones, that's right, yeah. yeah. But, you know, what if there was, what if there was some, uh, you know, what if Kong is rescuing them, right? <laughs> what, if, what if, in fact, that we just never got around to seeing it, but there's like on the other side of the island. Uh, they rescue you know, Kong right back. <laughs> <laughs> on the other side of the island, there's like this this society of of you know free Amazons who are they're now free from the, the patriarchal society. <laughs> God, I love of that. the village of the villagers, right? Yeah, you know they're all exactly one year apart in age. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I know. I can totally. Yeah, I, I. Yeah, no, I mean. I think there's different ways to do it. You know, you could, you can, you can have, um, you know, the, you know, the Linda Hamilton take is, you know, borders on that. You know, there's definitely some classic eighties moments, uh, of, of, you know, ogling Linda Hamilton in the movie, but, um, but yeah, it, it, I think that there's easily a way to do it. There's an easily to, a way to do, you know, it's not Jack Driscoll. It's, you know, Jane Driscoll or whatever. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. And so, so gender, a gender swap situation. Yeah. Or, you know, the captain, you know, there's, there's, yeah. you know, you can play with that kind of stuff. Um, I, I don't know if Kong needs to be male, you know, either. I mean, you can play with all of this stuff, but it, it, that one's a lot easier to me than how do you reconcile colonialism? And racism. <laughs> yeah. Well, so um, so HBO has in the news recently for pulling Gone with the Wind uh-huh. from HBO Max so that they could uh, re make it available with you know a, a historical context. Mm-hmm. Um, so, do you think that that's probably in the cards for Kong as well? I well, so I watch a lot of Turner Classic. Right? Yeah. Um, and 
when Ben Mankiewicz, you know, the, the crew they've got on there now is a lot different from Robert Osborne, who was, you know, you know, movie dad, you know, that we all grew up with on Turner Classic, where he was just like, movies are great. Isn't, isn't Lauren Bacall great? We're going to watch this Lauren Bacall movie. She's wonderful. You know, that was kind of Turner Classic for like a really long time. And he's passed and Mankiewicz has been around for forever now. And Eddie Muller's in there and Alicia Malone. And, and um, the woman who does the intros for the silent films is actually, she's a film scholar. She's actually a black woman. Um, so you can imagine she's got some things to say about how movies were working in the 1920s. Um, and they do do more commentary. I think all movies from a certain era before I don't, I don't believe in censorship flat out full stop. You know, you're not going to catch me watching birth of a nation, but I don't think we go burn all the copies of it. Right. Um, I think it's how we movies give us this unique opportunity that is, and the ready availability of them in 2020 gives us a unique opportunity to get a window into the past to see what people were thinking and feeling and to realistically consider what the mass population thought was perfectly fine and acceptable during an era when a movie came out because those things were made with an eye, not towards necessarily most movies, not towards shock, but towards speaking towards the most number of people possible, especially for popular entertainment. Um, And so talking about, you know, and that's why I said, well, I feel charitable about it because I, I, I think that you have to understand what was the actual mindset and going around and hating everybody who existed before 2020 is not particularly useful or instructive. Um, So, yeah, I think if you, you, you can, I don't know how you possibly set up all of, slavery and antebellum south etc etc into a you know pithy five minute intro um but i think it's a step in the right direction um and i i i i I think that with kong you could easily talk about kind of what was going on you know as far as people's understanding of the world and and what was the what were people running into when they you know got off a boat you know, in various parts of the world at this point that would have informed this uh, opinion of, of people in other parts of the planet are strange. Well, yeah, if you've only ever seen the people in your hometown. And by the way, before we get like <laughs> all like, like, oh, you know, people in the past were, were so like this, people in the present are like this too. Oh, yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. You, you know, you, you are people in Texas complaining about people from Dallas. Right. I mean, it's like anyone who does anything different from you is strange. And so it's this heightened Hollywood version of that, but it's also, you're getting pictures in national geographic, which is most people in like Indiana's only, you know, ability to see what the rest of the world looks like. That doesn't look like Indiana. And I'm thinking specifically of, um, Oh geez, that was actually New York, Bedford falls. Uh, but you know, the, the idea of like, what does someone look like from, you know, Somalia? What does somebody look like? And all you're seeing are these pictures of people you've never seen before wearing all this jewelry. And, and, you know, all you're getting is like a 15 page article about to, to try and get your grasp of an entire place and it's people. It's really, you know, it's, that's where I think we need to be more charitable to people from the past, even if they were hugely racist and caused, you know centuries of of, of horror and and all of that it's people were stupid and it was really they didn't have the context we now have at our fingertips so we need to help people along with movies sorry that's my 10 minute monologue on a very simple question no no i was that was what i was after (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah i mean i you know i watch a lot of noir and in movies from the 40s and 50s and and um, the only time you're going to see like a black person show up in there is they're never the detective, right? They're not, they're, they're either on stage performing or they're a waiter or frequently they're the staff on a train. Um, and that's it. And people are, you know, the movies are always nice and polite to each other and you know, whatever. 
uh, except I did watch a movie recently where that was not necessarily the case. It was kind of shocking. But you'd also be watching like a Marx Brothers movie and suddenly it bursts into a blackface sequence. And you're like, oh, right. It's 1937 or whatever in this This movie. was okay. Yeah. People, people freaking <laughs> yeah. love blackface in 1937. Yeah. So, yeah. um, yeah. I mean, not everybody, but, you know, enough people to sell tickets to and not sure. think it was weird. So, yeah. It, it, you know, I'd, I'd be curious to know the story. The guy who played the, the chief in the movie in 33 was named Noble Johnson, and I meant to look him up and see what his story was. But I, I, I said I was going to do more research before the movie. This is one of the things I planned to look up. <laughs> oh, Did not sorry about it. that. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. So... Anyway, we have been talking for a long time. Do you have anything else to add about like five Kong movies? <laughs> um, I think I got pretty much everything. My my general thoughts. I mean i I enjoy I enjoy Kong as a character. I enjoy the story. I've I've grown up with it. I feel like it's you know it's an inseparable part of uh, you know American culture, film history. I think the special effects are really great. Yeah, we still. didn't even talk about the special effects, but yeah. yes. I mean, they're amazing. They're amazing. And the Brontosaurus, the, with the Brontosaurus that eats people, which uh-huh. is, you know, <laughs> which is funny now, but I mean, it, it looks really cool. The it whole Brontosaurus amazing. scene looks amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it doesn't look, and I would say that it doesn't look real, but it just looks cool. It, it looks so you know? not real. There's like a weird dreamlike. Yeah. Feeling to a lot of it. Yeah. It's, it's hard. It's, it's got an eff- ineffable quality, if you will. And it, it's, it, it, it looks unreal in a way that is appealing to me. Unlike the 2005 digital world, mm-hmm. which looks unreal in a way that kind of turns me off, which I can't really say why that is. Um, it could be that the things that the effects in Kong are all real things that exist in a physical space that have real light bouncing off of them and that had to be manipulated by real people. Um, you know, and, and those kind of things, those, the handmade quality. I, I love another thing. I, I just always, I like miniatures and models and, and things like that. It mm-hmm. always fascinate me. So to see a miniature or a model that, you know, animates itself and moves around, is even cooler. So yeah. even to me, if it looks like a miniature, but it's moving around, that's cool. It's not real, but it's cool. And I, as a, as a kid watching those kind of things, I always just sort of, my head was able to make that leap of like, well, that's just what, it's not what, you know, apes look like, but that's what Kong looks like when he moves. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, and the only today, as I'm watching it in 2020, really the only glaring special effects thing that, that, that pops out as, as maybe I would prefer it done differently is when they make the switch from stop motion to full size puppet Mm -hmm. and the full size puppet doesn't match (laughs) at all (laughs) the stop motion. And then they go back to the stop motion. Like, Oh boy, that doesn't look great. But really everything else looks fantastic. Jamie, um, Jamie said, really, I, I thought it was kind of dead on. She's like, he's, he's, he's a gorilla and, or whatever in ape as Kong in the stop motion. And then they cut to the, the close up of the, the big head they actually built. Yeah. And she's like, and he's kind of adorable all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> he's got a different, cut, yeah. yeah. He's got a different face and it moves differently, mm-hmm. you know, and I, it, it's even a slightly different scale. Like it's, yeah, I I think that the the head is too big, like the the full size head is too is too big compared to how large it would have actually been at the scale that they were had them with the the little model humans or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I mean that's that's all kind of nitpicking. I mean, there's something that was that broke such ground um, in the field of like you know movie special effects. I mean, it was it was just so far beyond anything that had come before. Yeah, I probably wouldn't have brought this up two months ago, but um, the, it does a lot of rear projection, tons of rear projection. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so you'll have like a scene where it's like they've had Kongs in the foreground, and that's not the rear projection. The rear projection is the, the film of Andero film or, or of Fay Ray filmed like live. 
and or they'll flip it the other way. But the thing that made me the reason I wanted to talk about it was I don't know if you've watched the uh, the gallery, the show on um, Disney Plus about the Mandalorian, about the making of it. No, not yet. Totally go watch it. They the way they filmed it was basically like I couldn't figure out how they filmed that show. Like I was like, how do they afford to go to all these places? How did they? It's all rear projection. Hmm. It's it's super high resolution screens behind them, and you're like, and using game engines so they could just change whatever they wanted to behind. So them. they didn't go to a lot of locations. N- no locations. They that went to no thing, locations. Okay. Yeah. It, well, wow. I think I think they did some locations for the the like um, samurai episode with the ATST and. I think there were a couple other minor things they did, but almost all of it was filmed inside this, basically the sound stage with this crazy screen. And I'm like, Oh my God, this changes everything the same way going back to how they did things in 1933 to get these amazing effects of like, Oh, well you're in a hotel room. We can move the actual Kong arm in through this window, but in this window, we're going to be, showing you know the stop action or of, of kong's face you know right, coming right. through um so there's so much cool stuff there which then you get to the 76 one they're like ah, that's a guy in an ape suit <laughs> 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 we, we we went to a train hobby store and we bought a t- yeah. bunch of tiny trees and it's a guy in an ape suit it didn't even try it feels like i don't know i mean maybe there was a feeling in the 70s that stop motion just looked old-fashioned or something yeah. I I think so. I mean, they built the giant arm so they could like put Jessica Lang under the fountain repeatedly, which is like a really weird way to replace dinosaur fights. By I the just, way, I just I would have honestly, I would have preferred a Muppet. <laughs> had they just not had they not shown had they not done full body Kong, but instead had it been you know just a a large puppet, you know, operated by multiple puppeteers or something like that. I yeah. because having it be a guy in a suit, it's always going to look like a guy in a suit for no other reason than the proportions have to be. Yeah. You no, know, there are too human now. Yeah. I it mean, they, they did their best with anymore. the, uh, the, what was that? Congo. Uh, did you ever see Congo? Congo, the, it was, uh, a, it was like a Michael Crichton book. That yes. Yeah. Yeah. I did see that. Yeah. And there was like a dude in a real, really very real, realistic looking ape suit there. And they use them for like gorilla glue and stuff now. But I mean, that's all, you know, that was 20 years after that movie. And, um, but it does make me actually, you know, you asked about how would you adapt this for the modern era? And then you brought up the Muppet thing. The, you know, there's this Broadway show that just opened like a year, year and a half ago. Right. That's right. Yeah. Of the, it's all done with like 20 puppeteers with a giant marionette. And it looks fantastic. Yeah. And again, just like the stop motion, it doesn't look real, but mm-hmm. it looks great. Yeah. It looks like I, I see all the images that I saw immediately just struck me as, 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 as very strong imagery. And yeah, like you said, it's a full size ape, and it's and they use um, you know dancers and like all black against a black stage, and they're and they're just using wire work and stuff to to move his arms and, and his facial features and things. And it, all the videos clips that I've seen and and stuff look fantastic. And of course, if I were you know a millionaire, I would have gone to see it on Broadway. But there's yeah. no, I'm sad. I'm sad that um, uh, at least at at this point, there's I think only one song uh from the the musical that's been released um in any kind of uh, uh you know available format uh, other than bootleg and i didn't want to mess with the bootleg quality so i just figured i'd wait until eventually there was a full soundtrack available but i'm i'm very curious to to hear the songs and stuff um yeah i'm curious to see how they handle as you said you know the, the question of the natives um and, and just kind of how all of that ends up, uh, you know, pres- because no one, I've not heard any criticism of any of that as, as part of the show coming out. I don't uh, think the thing is, I don't think that it's a timeless story. I think it's a story that's, that's tied to a specific era. And the more they try to move it away from that era, the more that shows itself, you know? Yeah. Well, I think, I think the, the, the stage show takes place in the thirties. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, I, they're, they're doing some things that are anachronistic, but I, I'm pretty sure it takes place in the third, just because when I, I looked at, um, something it looked like there was a bunch of newsboys and stuff running around oh, like yeah, those yeah. kinds of costumes so but the song i heard from it sounded like they were riffing on hamilton so <laughs> it was like yeah i saw it it, it was during like uh, one of the thanksgiving parades mm-hmm. they had a performance during the thanksgiving parade last year or something yeah. like that yeah yeah well there's a there's a song that um that's from the show that the lead did is kind of like a music video, but it, it's not tied at all to the, to the actual stage. I think I show. know which one you mean because yeah, I listened to it and I thought this isn't very, this doesn't tell me anything about the story. Yeah. It was like her being her dreams of being the queen of New York. I think it's, it must be like, yeah, that's right. Queen of New York. That's right. Yeah. So. Again, t- another example of paralleling Anne and, and Kong together. Mm-hmm. Being in similar situations. Like oh, very good. You're very good at this. Much better than me. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> anyway, yeah. so yeah, Kong. Kong. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we we we're gonna let you people go. This is probably more than you wanted to think about <laughs> multiple King Kong movies in one shot. But uh, thanks for sticking with us. And Stuart, thank you so much. I, I actually really enjoyed making my way through all those Kong movies. It's going to be a while before I watch another Kong movie. Maybe. I felt a little guilty after a while because I was like, I don't know if he's really enjoying it. Cause he, he kept making these cracks. Like uh, I don't have time to do anything else. Cause I watch all these Kong movies. <laughs> next, our next podcast should be for plan of the apes and it should be an overview of the entire series. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I I will agree to that. I need some time though, because that is a bunch of depressing movies. I was kidding again. I okay. expected pushback. I expected pushback. <laughs> well, well, if you're talking about just the original five, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, then we can have a conversation yeah. no, about the, what no, we yeah, the original that. five, the original okay. five, the real apes, okay, and the TV show and the cartoon, and the TV show and the animated series, correct, <laughs> and the and the the comics. Right, we got to do all of that. Yeah, <laughs> and buy the Mego action figures. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's part of the research. I'm right. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> all right, man. Well, thank you so much, and uh, y'all. We will be back soon enough. Maybe to be playing of the apes. Who can say? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye. about wraps it up for this edition of the signal watch a production of the league of melbotus thanks for sticking with us if you enjoyed this podcast we invite you to drop on by the signal watch blog where you'll find write-ups of a wide variety of movies and more you can drop comments on this podcast and let us know what you think we do have a signal watch patreon and if you're so moved we'd most certainly appreciate your support We'll be back soon with more exceedingly high-quality content. So, until next time. God damn it, babies. You've got to be kind.